Okay, many thanks. Very nice to be here uh, uh, in Dublin. Um, I'm going to divide my talk into three parts. First of all, describe the challenge of designing to Passive House, the challenge of actually achieving the standard from a technical point of view, and then the reality of uh, building it. Um, the, the, we had a, a very good integrated team of people working uh, on the project, which I think was key to it. But just to tell you a little bit about Archetype, uh, I'm the director of the architects that led the project. Uh, we're a practice based in uh, both in London and Herefordshire, the west of England. Uh, been practicing uh, since 1984, and throughout that time, sustainability has been uh, one of our key driving uh, forces. And our focus has always been on designing buildings to save energy rather than relying on all the technological uh, sort of add-ons uh, to offset. And so for us, Passive House was a natural step uh, in the direction that we were already traveling and, and gave us sort of uh, a quality assurance discipline to, uh, to, to deliver and achieve that. So first of all, uh, the challenge uh, of design. I'm just going to divide that into two sections, both uh, sort of design issues and educational issues in terms of uh, designing a school, because for us, if we were going to take uh, our clients uh, and our buildings onto Passive House, we felt passionately that this uh, should not just be a worthy exercise in saving energy and ending up with, an, with a, a, a dreary building. It, the building had to be of high quality design, just the same as any other building, and it had to meet the educational aspirations uh, of the local authority and the school. If we didn't deliver that, then they wouldn't care if it was Passive House. Uh, it has to achieve those things as well. So first of all, from a design uh, point of view, um, uh, Archetype has got five sort of key themes to its uh, sort of design philosophy, uh, which underpin everything we do. First of all, we design through an engagingly collaborative process. We believe that we should work with our clients, with the children, with the teachers, in order to engage them in a design process so that the end result is a building which reflects their ideas, their aspirations, their practical needs, and that they feel part of. And I think this is really important, particularly with sustainable design, that they're taken on a journey of understanding the project. We then believe that buildings should be designed to be elegantly simple. I think architects and engineers love complexity. We like making things more complicated. In many ways, because it's much harder to make them simple. But when you do make them simple, you can actually get more value out of uh, budgets and actually achieve more in terms of sustainability because you're focusing money and effort on the things that really make a difference. We also want our buildings to be radically ecological, um, not just uh, reducing energy by little bits, not just by having one or two bits of nice materials, but fundamentally every aspect of the design and construction should be informed and driven by a passion for coming up with uh, radical solutions. We also feel that buildings should be uplifting and enriching. They should be, I mean, this is a great space to be in there. You feel good when you come into a good building. And we think every building, however modest, should lift the spirit. And we also feel that buildings should be uh, robust and timeless, that don't go out of fashion. I think fashion is great with clothes because clothes wear out quickly. But fashion in architecture uh, uh, you know, can mean that within a few years we think a building looks out of date and uh, whatever. But what we want are buildings that are long-lasting buildings like this one, this is actually our own office, a converted barn in Herefordshire, that hopefully will feel as relevant in 50, 100 years' time as it does five years after we moved in. And then from an educational point of view, um, this was a, a project that predated the Pastor House Schools. It was the first Briam Excellent Primary School in Britain. Um, and it was very much a project that grew out of uh, this very engaged collaborative process uh, that uh, led to creating spaces learning spaces, classrooms, and other shared teaching spaces uh, that were full of natural materials, full of daylight, good acoustics, uh, calm atmosphere, uh, good materials, good natural materials, so that the things that the children touch and feel and relate to uh, all add uh, a sense of quality and value to them. Uh, and this is just uh, uh, the main central shared hub space where they can have all sorts of different activities off which the classrooms open full of natural light, uh, created using natural materials, uh, and has become the real sort of social heart uh, to the school. But those ideas very much came out of the educational philosophy of the school. And so in moving on to the Passive Schools, we wanted to make sure that the same thing happened, that they delivered the educational philosophy of, of the school. So we had two projects uh, running in parallel, two primary schools uh, for children aged uh, for, uh, plus a nursery from children aged three up to 11, 
One of them was a two-form entry school, uh, 450 children, the other a one-form entry uh, uh, school. Uh, we had quite a tight time scale. We were appointed in December 2009. We had to get to planning submission following April at tender, contract appointed by June, uh, starting on site by September, finished uh, just over a year later, uh, and occupied October 2011. And then we finally received certification in January 2012. So quite a relentless uh, program uh, in terms of doing something uh, innovative. So why were these schools done to pacify us at all? Well, primarily because Archetype promoted the idea to the client. We'd worked with them on the Bream Excellent Primary School uh, and a number of other sustainable projects. And we said to them, OK, now we're doing these two schools. We think we should move on to Passive House and that it, this would be beneficial to you. We felt that it was a more sensible approach to uh, that than Bream, which we feel has become uh, a very bureaucratic tick box exercise, which doesn't, whilst it's trying to do lots of good things, it's not always delivering the best uh, value in terms of sustainable result. We felt that it was a more robust way to reduce carbon emissions than simply relying on renewables to offset, uh, as seems to be very common in the UK at the moment. Uh, we, I believe that it's much better to reduce carbon by using less energy than offsetting. I always say it's uh, the same as rubbish. It's good to recycle rubbish, but it's much better not to create rubbish in the first place. So too with energy. It's good to have renewable energy, but it's much better just to use less. Uh, we also uh, said to the client that it would achieve radically reduced running costs in terms of energy for the schools, uh, and that because Passive House is not just about energy, it's about internal comfort, it would create much better internal environments uh, for the children and the staff. We also then responded to the client's challenge that that all sounds great, uh, we like that, but you must achieve it at no extra cost. We've got a standard budget, uh, and it must also have no impact on the program. So that was the challenge that they set us. So can you do Passive House at no extra cost? Everybody that we uh, talk to at the conferences, et cetera, et cetera, always said Passive House costs 5 to 10% more at least. But the question we asked ourselves is, how much does construction really cost? Uh, so I want to introduce you to the Jono, that's me, Jono, rule of cost estimating, which is if you think it will cost more, it will. Um, <clears throat> and the price is a matter of priority. And when you think about it, all sorts of things in buildings have an impact on cost, uh, and all sorts of decisions that we make uh, have an impact on cost. Uh, and if you set out thinking something's going to cost more, then you'll spend the budget, and it will cost more. If you set out with a discipline it must be done at the same price, then you focus everything on doing that. Uh, and, uh, and that's where the whole idea about simplicity uh, and focus on, on that simplicity helps to drive uh, the, the result. I'm involved in lots of design review panels in Wales, uh, and I, I'm so frustrated. I so often get projects being presented to the panel where the architect says, I haven't got enough budget to make this building more sustainable. And I look at it, and I, and I say to them, look, that building is incredibly complicated. You've got a complicated plan, complicated section. You've got bits of structure flying out through everywhere. You've got five or six different cladding materials on one elevation. You've chosen to spend budget on complexity. You can't tell me you couldn't have chosen to spend that money on better sustainability. And that's what I feel is that we should, price is just a matter of priority. Some, some people spend more on a flashy German kitchen than somebody else spends in a whole house. It's just priorities. Obviously, there are things that cost more. You've got more insulation, you've got more high performance windows, you've got to achieve better air tightness, you've got to have heat recovery ventilation. There are things, some things which save money. You've got a smaller heating system. Uh, you don't need underfloor heating. You don't want underfloor heating. You can have simpler controls. You don't have to have renewables to meet energy uh, carbon targets. And there are other things which don't cost anything. Uh, uh, if we've designed uh, a, a building that just gets rid of thermal bridging in its detailing, it doesn't cost builders to build it any more to build it. Um, so some things cost more, some things cost less, some things don't cost any different. So overall, uh, our hope when we set out was that we could do this at no extra construction cost. Now, to do that, uh, I'll emphasize again simplicity. Um, the simplest way to achieve simplicity is through thought reduction. What can we take out to make things work better? Making the simple complicated is commonplace. Making the complicated simple, that's creativity. Great uh, jazz uh, musician Charlie Minkus, I think he sums it up really, really well there. And the other thing which I think is critical is evidence. I think the whole building industry uh, moves from one project to the next without ever learning the uh, lessons from the evidence of what's working, what's not working. Uh, at Archetype, we've done a, uh, been involved in a two-year research project in partnership with Oxford Brookes University 
to actually monitor in great detail the performance of about a dozen of our buildings and then learn from that so that we can feed those lessons back into practice. And that's where I think also Passive House comes in so well, that it's an evidence-based uh, sort of quality assurance system which in monitoring over 20 years uh, can consistently perform. So the three build, uh, sites there on the left are three housing projects. Obviously, the energy performance varies from house to house. Some are below and some are above, but they're all consistently below the 15 kilowatt hours per square meter. Whereas another claim to be low energy scheme, the average was up at nearly 70. Uh, and that's why we like Passive House, because it gives a rigorous discipline to actually enable you to design and build to actually deliver to a target, not just make a vague claim and then fail to deliver to that vague claim. So from a design point of view, I'm just going to show you a few photograph, drawings and photographs of the schools and then move on so you get a flavor for the design approach. Then I'll move on to actually talk about the technical challenges. Um, uh, so this is Oak Meadow. Uh, this is the site plan. Um, and you can see that we've located the building on a very exact north-south orientation so that we can control the solar gain and so, solar heating and get good daylighting. Uh, moving into the plan, you can see that it's a fairly uh, simple rectilinear plan, uh, both on the ground and the first floor. Uh, <clears throat> 3D view of the building. Uh, just moving into a little bit of the plan in more detail, you can see there's a simple hierarchy of small group rooms shared between two classrooms, which open onto a shared group space, and adjacent to that, you've got the main school hall. So you've got a simple hierarchy of organizational uh, planning, which works both at the ground floor and then at the first floor level with the hub space and then the hall. Uh, in terms of the section of the building, it's basically designed as a fairly simple extruded section which runs along uh, the majority of the building, getting uh, a good open aspect to the south and good daylight into the heart of the building just by lifting up part of the roof. Um, and if we just move into a little bit closer, you can see how that very simple section then translates into a series of um, uh, sort of internal, well daylit uh, spaces. In terms of designing uh, to achieve passive house, one of the critical things that is more expensive are windows because they're such high performance. So we spent a lot of work on rationalizing the design of the windows to simplify them uh, to basically on a sort of certified curtain warning system. So we had simple fixed lights, large simple opening lights, and then in blue on either end of these uh, uh, windows here, uh, a secure insulated shutter grill that would allow uh, ventilation uh, securely at night time. And you can see that there on, on the elevation. So a fairly, very simple, ordered, rational window uh, system. Uh, and that's repeated uh, around the building for each classroom. Uh, so again, just a, a, an overall ordered simplicity of, of approach in order to get more value out of an expensive product like a passive house window. Uh, a couple of pictures of the building uh, in situ. Um, you can see very simple breeze over the windows uh, and uh, a sense of how the building sits there and some of the internal spaces and the daylighting into the shared hub spaces. Uh, the other project, um, uh, Bushbury Hills Primary School, slightly smaller project. Uh, the site here was a completely different orientation uh, on a sort of angle. Uh, you can see we located the building again on, on, a, on a sort of fairly rigorous uh, north-south axis so that all the principal rooms are facing either north or south. Uh, it's absolutely critical in schools not to have classrooms facing east or west because the sun comes in low in the morning and afternoon and will just overheat and you can never uh, rescue yourself from that situation. Uh, this being a much smaller building, uh, we came up with an even simpler plan uh, of two rows of classrooms which are pulled apart at a slight angle to create a shared hub space at the heart of it. So there's no corridors in the building whatsoever, there's just a shared uh, space at the heart of the building. Uh, and again, the section is very, very simple. Um, uh, with the two halves just pulling apart with a lifted up roof and a flat roof to get light into the hub space. Um, and then a few photographs of the outside of it. That's the main school hall. This is the shared hub space, double height space at the heart of the building, which gets borrowed light from the south side into the north classrooms. Uh, full of, again, full of natural materials, lots of timber with organic finishes, natural lino on the floor, natural rubber, natural paints and stains. Uh, so the whole thing is not just energy, it's, it's designed out of a, a full palette of uh, natural materials. So that's actually a classroom on the north side, and you can see borrowed light coming in uh, from the south side and the left-hand side. I like this quote from Steve Jobs, design is not just what it looks and feels like, design is how it works, and I think that 
uh, is absolutely fundamental to our approach. Design has got to look good, it's got to feel good, but it's got to work at every level from a practical point of view and, a, and, a, and an energy point of view. So moving on now to how we achieve the standard, uh, some of the research that we did, uh, issues of form, structure, ventilation, heating, and certification. Uh, we start off by learning from others. Although we had a lot of experience with sustainable design, uh, nobody had done a passive house school in the UK before, so we did lots of visits to Germany and Belgium. A lot of the knowledge was only published in German, and one of the issues was that whereas in the UK every school has a kitchen and does full catering at lunchtime, most German schools have any kitchens at all because they all go home at lunchtime. Uh, there were other differences and challenges uh, in terms of size, occupancy, school day length. Uh, German schools seem quite happy to leave windows open at night for night cooling. Uh, in the UK, people break in and steal things. And also, in Germany, children don't seem to jump out of windows, whereas in the UK, apparently they do. <coughs> um, so we, uh, we looked at a lot of the uh, evidence and visited projects in Frankfurt. Uh, we uh, did a lot of uh, work uh, using Passopedia uh, and contacted people involved in schools and with the Passive House Institute. Um, right at the start, uh, we developed a parametric front-end plug-in to PHPP so that we could analyze uh, the form of the building. We looked at options of deep plan, shallow plan, single story, two story, uh, lots of different options so we could get a feel for how it, it actually worked. Uh, and it, seemed for, it was absolutely critical to us uh, that we had to optimize the floor area to surface area volume and that a two-story solution was going to be the way to go. And again, people currently seem to think that little children can't walk upstairs. Primary schools have to be single story. Uh, whereas in the past, primary schools were almost always two or three stories. Uh, and uh, the schools were initially reluctant, but as we talked them through it, they became quite to like the idea. And now they're in occupation. They love their two-story school. And, uh, uh, the, even, uh, and the children particularly, the older children, like the idea that they progress upstairs as they get older. Uh, and it seems to work uh, really well from an educational point of view. Uh, one uh, sort of word of uh, warning is that we were delighted when we did our first design. So we got to 15 kilowatt hours per meter. Hey, we've made it. But uh, don't celebrate too early uh, because it gets hard as you go along there. And what we feel really is you need slack at the planning stage. And you really need when you're at the design stage to target 12 or 13 so that you can accommodate all the little changes and still come in under. Uh, because it gets, it, uh, but also, if you're going to do it at a price, you need that slack because it's... Uh, you know, if, if you go in with no slack and then you have to suddenly add in a little more insulation to make it work because something else has given, then it costs money. So if you're going to do it at a price, you've got to have slack and give yourself room to manoeuvre. So in terms of the uh, construction, uh, we had to have a piled solution, but we wanted to get rid of the thermal bridging from concrete piles. So we came up with uh, a, a very simple solution where the ground beams and the piles were put in deeper uh, and then the structural slab that the building sat off was floating over the top of that with rigid insulation. So there's no structural connection between the piling system, uh, grid and the building itself. It's got polystyrene over the top and then structural slab, slab, slab uh, floating on top of that. Now the structural engineers, when we first suggested this, said that, that won't work. And we said, uh, we, we need to do that. They went away and they came back and said, yeah, that works fine. And it was just challenging their normal thinking uh, and getting them to think beyond what they normally do and it worked fine. So we've got a structural slab, concrete slab, with a load-bearing timber uh, wall coming down on that, which obviously has quite a bit of timber in it, but also insulation. And then on the outside of, uh, we've got our air tightness layer, obviously on the inside, and then on the outside of that, we've got the insulation coming under the slab, up the slab, and then on the outside of the load-bearing timber wall, we've got an outer lightweight layer framed with uh, I-beams to create uh, what we're calling a duvet layer, a wrap of insulation. So we've got effectively continuous insulation coming all the way around from under the slab up the building and then uh, the cladding on the outside of that to make it uh, weathertight. So in terms of that uh, detail, this is some of the analysis we did to actually look at uh, the thermal modelling uh, and demonstrating that the solution we come up with actually had no bridging whatsoever uh, through it and that's the sort of thing that you have to do uh, with Passive House. Uh, and just as we go up, the, I hope you can, I don't know how clear that is on the screen from there, uh, but basically this is demonstrating uh, our structural load-bearing layer, um, our, our outer duvet layer, uh, and then uh, a few pictures of the uh, project as it was being finished. Um, but the sort of junctions that on this project we learned, uh, although we're trying to keep it simple, where you did have sort of 
uh, a change of roof things, those were the areas that we really struggled with to deal with air tightness. So on the next project, we're simplifying even further uh, uh, and so learning lessons that. So where that pitched roof came in against that wall, having to make sure that that junction was completely uh, airtight. Uh, this photograph just shows how well we've, uh, all of the structure where we've got um, load-bearing uh, glue down columns and beams is kept entirely inside the thermal envelope. There's not a single piece of structure that uh, cantilevers out through the wall, the columns and the beams are all inside the thermal envelope. And then where we've got roof overhangs, that's done completely outside the thermal envelope uh, so that nothing penetrates. Uh, I think all of us are used to building buildings with bits of structure, bits of roof, just crash through the envelope, can't do that, got to get rid of that thermal bridging. In terms of the ventilation strategy, uh, we've got a very simple arrangement where we're supplying fresh air into the groups and the classrooms and then taking out of the shared hub spaces with transfer grills between the classrooms and the hub spaces to transfer air. So quite a simple solution there. Uh, and then in the main hall, um, air is taken from the hub space uh, into that space uh, to provide fresh air when people are in there. Uh, there were a number of issues that we had to deal with uh, uh, in, in terms of dealing with ventilation at a scale of a school to do with timing controls because people are not there in the evenings, that when the ventilation goes off in the evening, the filters need to be dried out. Uh, we've got a central CO2 modulation, so if uh, the, the return air is, the CO2 is rising, they can apply some more fresh air into the building. Um, one of the particular issues we tackled was kitchens, which I'll come back to. Um, uh, this is the high-level window, so you can see there are opening lights, but there are also these grills on either side which can be left open for night cooling. That's the other thing to say in terms of the ventilation strategy. At night time, uh, we've got uh, a passive cooling uh, system and, and in summer, so the ventilation gets turned off, you open windows, open shutters manually and at high level automatically, and those secure shutters can be left open at night to cool down the building during hot weather, and we've used that successfully on many projects over the years. One of the particular issues we needed to tackle was kitchens. Um, most catering kitchens are gas cooking, and with gas cooking you get the need for a lot of ventilation. Uh, and with that ventilation, because you've got fumes and you've got heat, uh, you're taking out a huge amount of energy, and then you're having to preheat the air coming in, otherwise it would be cold, so it takes a huge amount of energy. So we set out to tackle that and to persuade the caterers that they should move from gas to electric induction cooking, which they were very reluctant to do because it's a new, you know, new way of cooking. We persuaded them, uh, and with that, uh, it means that the, it's a classic bit of efficiency because there's no excess heat, there's an induction loop into the, into the pan, uh, so it's a really, really efficient way to cook. You get, you get no excess heat in the kitchen, you drastically reduce the ventilation demand uh, for, for, the, for the space, and so it becomes not only more efficient to cook, but much more efficiently to ventilate uh, and, and heat and cool. And uh, that... Uh, has worked really well. They've been occupied since October. The cooks absolutely love it. The catering managers absolutely love it. They say it's the best kitchen they've ever worked in. Uh, uh, the energy performance of it is really good. And they're now actually replacing any cooker that goes wrong anywhere uh, in Wolverhampton, in any school, with electric induction because they like it so much. So that was a real win-win for Passive House. It drove a more efficient solution, which actually works better. Um, that's a view of the kitchen. Uh, in terms of heating, alongside the ventilation, we've got um, a, a simple uh, strategy of radiators to give top-up heating with a thermostatic radio valve, so really low-tech uh, solution, um, and two domestic-sized gas boilers powering the whole building. In fact, one is enough to power it, and the other is there for backup. Um, uh, and people cannot believe it when they go into a 2,500 square meter school and find a boiler the same size as in their house. It really does uh, shock people. It even shocked the, our m and engineers, who we'd worked with for many, many years. They almost didn't believe that it would work. Uh, and they certainly didn't believe that one radiator in each classroom would be enough. So they put in two radiators in each classroom. Uh, and now the building's been occupied through the winter. And we've walked around the building many times with people and with our m and engineers. And not a single radiator is on, to the extent that people are now using their radiators as display boards and blue tacking displays to the radiators. Uh, they're actually saying, actually, we, we realise now we don't need uh, uh, two radiators. We need, just need one small radiator in each room uh, just to give top-up heating before the children arrive in the morning. As soon as children are there, their own heat and occupation and the ventilation system provides everything that they need. Um, we also gave a lot of site support, uh, specialist workshops, regular vi visits, uh, uh, air tightness inspections. Uh, we did a huge amount of uh, sort of extra inspections 
not in an aggressive way, but actually uh, everyone working together, and I think that was absolutely uh, critical. Uh, and then certification, um, uh, what we learned through certification is it's the unbelievably rigorous uh, process. Uh, it puts Lead and Briam into, into you know, uh, you know, aside really, because, uh, but it's rigorous on all the things that matter. You have to provide PHPP, you have to provide the evidence of all the primary energy uh, a quick kit that you've got in the building from every computer to every fan, it's energy consumption, you have to provide evidence that the windows that you said you were going to install have been installed. We even had to provide photographic evidence that there wasn't more timber in the walls than we said, uh, and the insulation was right. So it was an incredibly rigorous process. Uh, but what they're actually doing is proving and ensuring that the quality is actually delivered, as it says on the can, which is why Classic House actually works in reality. Um, just another quote to sum up this whole approach. What you put into may make a building good, but it's what you leave out that make it great. Again, emphasizing uh, the simplicity of making things work. So just finally, the last quick section, the reality of building, this is actually some slides put together by a contractor uh, in terms of his experience. Uh, this is what the contractor thought of it. <coughs> um, actually, uh, they, they were very, very positive. Uh, they found it quite a challenge. They uh, started off by... Um, uh, us running a workshop. They then took the effort to go with their contract manager and the site agents to Germany to visit Passive House projects. Uh, and they were told there, for your first Passive House, start with a small house. Uh, and they obviously started with two large schools, uh, but that's just how it went. They reprogrammed the work uh, uh, in a different order uh, in order that they could do air tightness tests at the right time before they started doing second fix. Um, they put a lot of effort into thermal imaging and uh, air tests in stages so that they could make sure they were achieving the quality. Uh, and ultimately, we achieved 0.48, uh, which uh, is below the 0.6 you have to achieve uh, for, for passive house, and well, well below the UK standard of 10 under test. They did a lot of work with their supply chain, getting key members, timber frame, windows, suppliers, air tightness, ME on board, and workshops, understanding what they needed to do as their contribution to passive house. Now, these are figures uh, which cover the entire cost of not just the school, but the landscape and, the, uh, uh, and all the design team, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and these are benchmark figures from the UK uh, that show that a typical sustainable school uh, uh, is generally coming in at 2,150 square metre. St. Luke's Primary School, which is very excellent, 2,090, and the two passive schools came in lower at 2,069. If you're talking about the actual construction of the building, you're down at about uh, 1750 a square metre uh, uh, at UK sterling um, uh, for the Passive High Schools, which is very, very competitive with what schools cost in the UK uh, at the moment. So the contractor's conclusion was that Passive House is the future. People say that the UK contractors can't do it, but they believe that they can, and the UK can do it. I'm sure Ireland can as well. Uh, 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 there's a lot of scepticism about whether we've got the skills to do that. I think there's no doubt uh, that when you go to a typical German building site, it's basically no better or worse than the average UK or I'm sure Irish site, but they just focus on the things that matter. Uh, I always say that, you know, it wouldn't be, well, we all know it's not reasonable or acceptable to put together a building where the roof leaks water. Uh, in Germany, it's just not acceptable to build a building where the walls leak air, and we've just got to get into that psychology, really. So we're now working together uh, in a sort of joint venture to, to develop a more standardised approach to delivering passive house schools, uh, meeting the UK government's challenge of building at 15 to 20% cheaper. Uh, so that's our next uh, challenge, really, to, to do that. So in conclusion, how did we achieve these passive house schools at uh, no extra cost within the budget that was there? Well, first of all, integrated total design team commitment uh, having, developing and working with people that have got passive house expertise, integrating passive house thinking into design from day one. If you design a building and then decide to turn it into passive house later, you just won't get there at the right seller price. It has to be integrated into thinking at every stage. A constant focus on simplicity of design and detailing, a relentless focus on achieving the best value solutions to achieve cost. Working with a contractor that was committed to actually delivering to Passive House. Ongoing teamwork across the design team and the contracting team at every stage throughout the construction. Focus workshops with all key subcontractors and then rigorous and extra site inspections done in a collaborative way. And what was fantastic for us about this project was delivering to Passive House schools uh, 
and throughout that contract, there is not a single piece of uh, aggressive, negative paperwork on the project. If there was ever an issue, you pick up the phone, you talk about it, you go to the site, you sort it out, and it was all done in that spirit of collaboration, which I think is the only way to deliver uh, better quality. As soon as you get into contractual arguments, you, know, you won't do it. You've got to do it in a collaborative way. Uh, I like this little diagram which uh, Wolfgang Feist uh, tweeted last year, just summing up where we were, where we are now, and where with Passive House we could and should be in the future. Simple solutions designed on simple principles. At the end of the day, my belief is that our, the architecture should do all the hard work in creating low energy sustainable solutions. Passive House does that. It is logical, it's evidence based. It does encourage simplicity of design and thinking. And I think in doing that, it frees us up to be creative because we know we can run on it working. It does lead to reduced energy. Uh, we've had very, very good uh, monitoring in the first winter. Uh, I think it does enable you to achieve high quality design that actually, in the words of Steve Jobs, work. And it can help you do it at an affordable cost. And obviously, when you do that, you're also achieving uh, radical running cost savings of at least 80% compared to uh, uh, UK building regulations from day one, year on year. Um, so uh, I think that, that in conclusion, the best bit of feedback we had was a head teacher in Oak Meadow School saying that she finds, and her teachers find, that the children are actually now concentrating better in the afternoon, every day after lunch, because the air is so constantly fresh and the daylight is so good. Uh, and that can only lead on, I think, to uh, you know, people who are happy with their environment who are actually going to learn and teach better. And that, at the end of the day, is obviously one of the most critical things. Thank you very much.